Uh, I'm going to have to ask for your... First of all, I'm going to have to ask whether you can actually hear me. Uh, and second, for your tolerance, because in fact I'm still under the suffering the after effects of flu. So if my voice fades in and out or if the meaning fades in and out, um, please ascribe a modicum of that um, to the flu. Um, I'll be speaking around rather than to um, an exhibition called A Dream of Urbanity, uh, which is a mixed exhibition of work by artists, architects, uh, designers and engineers, uh, one of whom uh, I am. But I won't be speaking about the individual work, though I will be showing slides of some of the work in the exhibition. Uh, but I'll be speaking instead about some of the ideas and concepts around the exhibition um, and why the idea of the city, and in particular the polarity of the city as either utopia or dystopia, might be of interest to artists. Uh, and by artists I mean not just visual artists, but also architects uh, and writers. My wife and I own a house on a small to middling size island in Greece, which lies between Crete and the mainland. The house itself is on the side of a hill, which is made up almost entirely of what used to be mountain pasture, which is now slowly reverting to scrub. It's about half a kilometre from the nearest other inhabited houses. It's one and a half kilometres from the nearest general store, and some five kilometers from a little market town where one can get basic goods and services. The journey from Athens can take up to eight hours by sea or 45 minutes by air uh, using the small 12-seater aircraft which lands in an airfield on the north of the island. Uh, and then there's another half hour drive by car to the house. All in all, if you're lucky with your connections, you could leave North London around midnight, take a night flight, and be pruning olive trees by lunchtime the next day. Actually, if you're not into pruning olive trees or watching sheep graze, you're out of luck, because there's not very much else to do other than read, which is fine as far as I'm concerned. In other words, the place is about as quiet, peaceful, and remote as the Shetland Isles, though with rather better weather. Anyway, the reason for this long-winded preamble is that two or three years ago I found myself there on my own in midwinter, roughly this time of the year. And by this time the last of the small foreign colony of amateur eccentrics and wannabe artists had all drifted away to Europe. And even the local upwardly mobile yuppies had moved to the capital with their cell phones. This left behind a population of some 1,500 souls, most of them above the age of 60. Uh, and these were scattered between some 20 or so tiny villages and hamlets. At that point, the February storms came down as usual. The flights were cancelled indefinitely. The aging and no longer economically viable ferry boat was mysteriously run aground on the southern Mediterranean's best known reefs, suddenly becoming an incredibly valuable piece of insurance write-off. Uh, my equally ancient and vulnerable VW Beetle uh, broke one of its engine mountings on the tracks which the rain had turned into gullies, and it was discovered that the only possible spare part was in Athens, which at that point might have been as remote as Timbuktu. So suddenly, I found myself a pedestrian in a virtually pre-industrial society, which was not too desperate a situation, as I had no very ambitious plans beyond sawing bits of the famous olive trees between breaks in the rain. And for the first few days, things were fine. Until one morning, I woke up with a sense of extreme angst. The reasons for which didn't take very long to become clear. It had suddenly become obvious to me what life must have been like living in a place like this any time in the past, but not as a visitor, year in, year out, any time up to the end of, oh, say, the end of the Greek Civil War which is not that, that long ago. In fact, it was the year I was born in. What would this mean? This would mean that conversations would take almost exclusively place with my nearest neighbors, 
who, amiable though they are, have nothing really to talk about except the olive crop, the weather, rheumatism, land tenure. Um, going down to the market town, one could increase one's intellectual horizons by taking in local and political gossip. Reaching the main harbor of the island, which is 35 kilometers to the north, would represent a major operation, something one wouldn't really try and do more than twice in a year. As for reaching Athens, that wonderful, breathtaking, cosmopolitan mecca, and incidentally, the nearest place in which anybody could be found to talk about art without taking you for a complete lunatic, is something that you probably, unless you came from one of the richest families on the island, or were going to emigrate for good, would be something you would only do maybe twice in a lifetime. If you were emigrating in any case, you were more likely to end up in New York or Smyrna. It is in fact amazing how terrifyingly and breathtakingly fast one's horizons, both mental and physical, suddenly shrink in such a context. At one moment you're trying to decide whether to hit LA or else thinking that perhaps now is the time to visit Easter Island before people ruin it completely. The next thing you know, you realize that nether wallop or middle wallop are the extreme range of your ambitions and about even that's only conditional on the rain stopping. As a mind-altering experience, I can assure you it has no equal. Can we have the lights down now? Thanks. This is not, as it happens, a commercial, extolling, a commercial extolling the benefits of the internal combustion engine. Nor is the point the virtue of mobility for its own sake. What I think I'm more interested in talking about is the perennial lure that the city has. If you think about it, Cities are among the most unlikely and unself-evident of humanity's early constructs. Settlements, yes, settlements make sense. It makes sense to hang around with four or five others of your own kind. It gives you a better chance to beat off the cave bears or those ugly beggars from the other side of the valley with those heretical beliefs and their poor taste in headgear. Hamlets, villages, even market towns all tend to develop along fairly obvious and natural lines. They have their own dynamic. We can understand them. Cities, however, are in the face of it unnatural. Why accumulate so many people in one place? How do you feed them? What will they all do? Why should some poor bastard growing barley in the countryside contribute all or part of it to feeding the idle sods behind the walls, since said idle sods obviously can't grow their own? If you insist on bringing all these people together, then you must do one of two things. Either A, create quite a sophisticated economic market model, according to which it will pay your farmer to bring crops into the city for sale, or else B, you must assemble a gang of thugs, train and discipline them, and have them bring the goods in by force. Whether you choose to call them tax collectors, customs officers, or policemen is entirely up to you. In either case, you will need to develop accounting systems, and hence almost certainly a form of writing, and long-term storage, and depots, and grain silos, in order to even out the inevitable bumps in supply. Because if you don't, all the people you have laboriously gathered together in that one place will rise up and thump you. You must also allow for the fact that after so many days of travel, a mule, a pack horse, an ox wagon, or a camel caravan will have consumed more than they can themselves carry, a factor which limits urban expansion very quickly, unless, of course, you build on a river or natural harbor, which is why usually sensible people tended to do just that. This has been merely by way of underlining the inherent implausibility of cities as such. But then, as we know, they seem to have caught on remarkably early in history, at least if Middle Eastern archaeology is anything to go by. And once they did, there was no turning back. For as etymology constantly conspires to remind us, civilization and the city are very closely linked concepts. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, urbanity is, de is derived from the Latin word urbs, or city. Amongst the definitions are the character or quality of being urbane, civility, and the state, condition, or character of a town or city. From civil, we get definitions including orderly, well-governed, civilized, educated, refined, sober, decent, and polite, though 
many of these seem rather dubious in the modern urban context, as well as, quote, pertaining to the community of citizens, something that we understand from the Conservatives doesn't exist anymore. The same tight web of associations runs through all European languages. There can be no urbanity outside the Urbs, no civility without Civitas. Politismos, civilization in Greek, is itself inconceivable before the appearance of the polis. For the ancients, living in cities was the essential prerequisite of civilized life. Beyond the walls, life was nasty, almost certainly brutish, and above all, uncivil. The development of the classical Greek city-state represented the first serious attempt at an ideological vindication of the urban lifestyle whose theoretical ideal was to become 4th century Athens. An ideal, of course, heavily dependent upon the existence of a slave caste um, and not giving the vote to women or to anybody who didn't own sufficient property. Uh, but both of those developments were very late coming to the rest of Europe too. Once the interests of a ruling class came to require the collaboration, or at least the tolerance, of a highly concentrated population, to the urban advantages of discourse with one's fellows, commercial opportunity, and the safety of numbers, was added the very tangible advantage of a relative freedom from oppression. Even, now and again, the chance for certain social categories to participate in one form or another of democratic debate. A polarity thereupon developed almost instantly between city and countryside. A polarity immediately seized upon by moralists, political theorists, poets, comedians, and other intellectual riffraff. The time-honored knockabout double act of country bumpkin and city slicker already fully fledged in the Greek comedies of Aristophanes, keeps resurfacing irrepressibly through the ages, whether in Roman eclogues, Byzantine satires, medieval Latin drinking songs, Jacobean tragedy, and 20th century Bollywood films. If at first the balance of opinion amongst intellectuals, who were by definition free citizens, favored the city as a free, exciting, and sophisticated arena, it didn't take long for the antithetical stance to develop, one which regarded cities as the source of all evil. Not surprisingly, perhaps, it can be found in abundance in the essentially pre-urban Old Testament, particularly amongst the minor prophets from Naum, Woe to the bloody city, it is all full of lies and robbery, to Zephaniah, Woe unto her that is filthy and polluted, woe to the oppressing city. The maledictions of Old Testament prophets were echoed, fashionably and rather more elegantly, by the Roman poets of the Golden and Silver Ages. For Horace and his imitators, flight from the city was identified with a return to the purity and simplicity of ancestral virtue. Interestingly, however, while a literary tradition of lauding the countryside at the expense of the city flourished for many centuries, it is significant that few, if any, of his eulogizers actually practiced what they preached to the extent of fleeing their townhouse or even garret for a cottage. When business, necessity, or political exile drove a Roman or Elizabethan poet from town, his complaints were heart-rending indeed. After all, it had very early become apparent that with almost no exceptions, the promotion of a literary or artistic career far from the city is impossible. The polarities of literary convention have been mirrored by politics. Time and again, cities have taken on the role of protectors or promoters of liberty. The Greek cities of Ionia contrasted their independence, chaotic and bloody though it might have been, with the despotism of the king of Persia. The free Italian cities of the Renaissance constantly fought to avoid falling under the sway of the emperor, the pope, or the dukes of, the Mil of, the dukes of Milan while the English Civil War pitted the city of London and the developing commercial centers of the Midlands against the Crown. A frequent source of riot, strife, and civil commotion, cities have usually been regarded with profound suspicion by most governments, if only because of the very high concentration of political malcontents. Not without reason did Louis XIV move his residence from Paris to Versailles, having as an infant been driven from Paris by the Fraud Rebellion, <coughs> the Sun King was determined never again to place himself at the mercy of his most loyal subjects.
Of course, the dawning of the Industrial Age brought into being a new image of the city, perhaps the darkest and most sinister yet. And yet, despite it all, the 19th century was also the great age of European urbanization, as peasants in their tens of thousands poured into the cities to operate those same dark satanic mills, while intellectuals, writers and artists, simultaneously repelled and fascinated, continued their traditional love-hate relationship with the city at an even more intense pitch. Amy Zola's 19, 1898 novel, Paris, offers an uncanny demonstration of this apparent schizophrenia, the revulsion from the horror of the city allied to the almost demonic belief in the ideal of the city, which is one form of the dream of urbanity. Here are the opening lines of the novel. After two months of bitter cold, ice and snow, the city was steeped in a mournful, quivering thaw. From the far-spreading, leaden-hued heavens, a thick mist fell like a morning shroud. All the eastern portion of the city, the abodes of misery and toil, seemed submerged beneath ruddy steam, amid which the panting of workshops and factories could be divined. It was a Paris of mystery, shrouded by clouds, buried between the ashes of some disaster, already half sunk in the suffering and the shame of that which its immensity concealed. And here now, 600 odd pages later, is how Zola concludes the same novel. The declining sun was once more veiling the immensity of Paris with golden dust. But this was no longer the city of the sower. It now seemed as if one and the same crop had sprung up on every side, imparting harmony to everything and making the entire expanse one sole boundless field, rich with the same fruitfulness. There was corn, corn everywhere, an infinity of corn whose golden wave rolled from one end of the horizon to the other. And then Marie, with a fine gesture of enthusiasm, stretched out her arms and raised her child aloft as if offering it in gift to the huge city. See, Jean, see, little one, she cried. It's you who reap it all, who store the whole crop in the barn. And Paris flared, Paris which the divine sun had sown with light, and where in glory waved the great future harvest of truth and of justice. This contradiction seems to encapsulate the mystery and the attraction of the city for artists of all kinds, and I include writers and architects and town planners in this term. The sense that this thing which we have built represents both the worst and the best within us, or if not yet the best, then at least we have offered a potential for bringing out the best. Of course, no city in the world has lived under the double burden of dream and nightmare as deeply as Petrograd or St. Petersburg or Leningrad. That city of contradictions, of Baroque palaces shimmering above the water, standing on the bones of the tens of thousands who perished in its building, surrounded by rotting slums, hammered in turn by Stalin's purges and by Hitler's siege, the city of Pushkin, Gogol and Akhmatova, of the faceless nose and of the bronze horsemen. A sure sign of the city's grip on human imagination is the way some of its avatars can become mythologized, not just become the site of mythos, but become mythos themselves. St. Petersburg is one such example, perhaps the finest and most complete. All of us will think of others. But what are the perceived attractions of the city? of city life for most of its population past and present. It is possible to draw up a table contrasting what have traditionally been regarded as the characteristic virtues and vices of the city compared to the country. Interestingly, whether in their positive or negative connotations, these characteristics invariably cluster around the basic polarity of open and closed. For example, for the city, we have a positive virtue in theory always, of liberal, as against the conservatism of the country. The flip side of those would be that the city might be regarded as radical, the country as reactionary. The city would be seen as democratic, the country as paternalistic, or by their respective enemies, as anarchistic and authoritarian respectively. The city is cosmopolitan, the country is traditionalist, or decadent and obscurantist. 
the city is agnostic, the country is pious, or atheistic and sanctimonious. The city is mercantile, the country is pastoral. The city is multicultural, the country is monocultural. The city is tolerant, the country thinks it's principled. The city is a site of vital action, the country is a site of serenity. Or, again, looking at the negative connotations, the city is hysterical, the country is stagnant. Essentially, it is this quality of open versus closed, of emancipation and receptivity, which I think has been the city's most abiding attraction, even when the openness turns out to be little more than a mirage. Openness, openness to new ideas, to economic improvement, to escape from stifling tradition, or simply to a better life than that of one's parents and grandparents. Aspirations which seem far beyond far beyond reach in a hamlet or a small market town, both apparently fixed forever in their ancestral rut, can become probabilities in a city. From wherever you care to stand, it seems that cities, for better or worse, are where the action is. At the end of the day, the prevailing view has always been that to turn one back on the city is tantamount to stepping outside history. Which is not to say, of course, that for a great many of their inhabitants, cities from Babylon to Hong Kong have not proved to be a greater source of misery than could ever have been imagined in the ancestral village. The end of the 20th century finds the reputation of cities at a dismally low ebb, with parts of certain American cities acquiring an almost emblematic identity as a paradigm of, of hell on earth. The contemporary crisis of cities appears to stem from two different causes depending upon whether they are in the first or third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so on worlds. In the first world, crisis has come about largely because of the social polarizations directly provoked and even pursued by a succession of ideologically motivated conservative administrations, such as have characterized Britain and the USA. In the rest of the world, many cities are suffering from a lack of resources, collapsing infrastructures, a mushrooming population and corrupt or incapable administrations, to most of which problems it could be argued that the economic policies of advanced capitalism have to a large extent contributed. Politically, perhaps the most important recent development in Western cities has been the dramatic shift of power in favor of centralizing and conservative administrations. For example, taking advantage of Britain's lack of constitutional safeguards, Margaret Thatcher's attack on the cities began with the legislative disenfranchisement of London, now the only European capital without a unitary city government, and continued with the passage of the poll tax, whose principal effect, if not purpose, was the removal from the electoral rolls of those members of the urban proletariat and subproletariats least likely to share her political beliefs. In the United States, the increasing segregation of the urban population into haves and have-nots has been graphically described by Mike Davis in City of Quartz. Welcome to post-liberal Los Angeles, where the defense of luxury lifestyles is translated into a proliferation of new repressions in space and movement, undergirded by the ubiquitous armed response. This obsession with physical security systems and collaterally with the architectural policing of social boundaries has become a zeitgeist of urban restructuring. Images of carceral inner cities, as in Escape from New York and Running Man, high-tech police death squads, as in Blade Runner, sentient buildings, as in Die Hard, urban bantustans, Vietnam-like street wars, and so on, only extrapolate from actually existing trends. Such dystopian visions grasp the extent to which today's pharaonic scales of residential and commercial security supplant residual hopes for urban reform and social integration. And yet, and yet despite everything, people everywhere in the world continue to vote with their feet. Neither in reality nor metaphorically have the pavements of any city in the world ever turned out to be paved with gold. But the great shift of population from country to city has continued unabated over the centuries. The few examples of reverse migration we know about were the result not of choice, but of force of circumstance, total war, famine, or plague, and invariably proved temporary. Even Phnom Penh has now been repopulated. 
Interestingly, one of the few examples of an entire working city swiftly and silently vanishing away, always with the exception of essentially ritual sites, such as those of the Incas and the glorified camps or great mobile cities of the Mongols, was that of Tigranocerta. Named in honor of Tigranes of Armenia, great king and king of kings by right of conquest, Tigranocerta was never a fortunate city. Founded around 89 BC on the edge of the northern Syrian plain, its principal, indeed only purpose, was to pander to the vanity of its founder, there being little in the way of opportunities for trade, commerce, or manufacture in that desolate location. Tigranocerta seemed doomed to remain severely underpopulated until the year 78, when the great king invaded the neighboring state of Cappadocia. He returned home with no fewer than 30,000 Cappadocian captives. What better use for them under the circumstances than to make them the happy beneficiaries of royal enthusiasm for town planning, installing them, volens nolens, in Tigranocerta. In less than a decade, the new foundation, now the Armenian capital, had been endowed with a wall 60 cubits in height, a vast palace, hunting parks, splendid public buildings, and the greater part of the royal treasury. Few, however, of its forced inhabitants showed much enthusiasm for their residence. Sadly, the shifting kaleidoscope of Near Eastern politics, then as now, took another turn in the year 69 BC, when the consul Lucius Licinius Lucullus, with two Roman legions, crossed the Euphrates and then the Tigris rivers and besieged the new capital. The king of kings gathered together an army estimated at a quarter of a million men to relieve the garrison, and the result was the by now tediously inevitable and undisputed victory for Rome. So vast was the plunder that, as the Roman historian Strabo cynically notes, the delighted troops were but easily persuaded to refrain from massacre. The citizens, in any case, were hardly the late king's most faithful subjects. In what must be one of the most extraordinary disposal of a conquered city's population ever seen, they were each given a small sum of pocket money and told to go off home. But first, as described by the abused pen of Alfred Duggan, was held a little ceremony which must have given great pleasure to the cultured Lucullus. The magnificent theater of Tigranocerta had been completed just before the siege began, and a company of actors engaged for the opening performance had actually been caught inside the town. In the presence of the Roman army, the curtain rose up on a short season of Greek plays. Then, the whole magnificent foundation, city, theater, palace, and suburbs, was left desolate. Now we do not exactly know where the city was located in the Syrian desert. What of the future? Within a few years, probably just past the millennium, the majority of the world's population will for the first time be housed in cities and megalopolises. The current figure is, I think, 40% of the world's population living in cities, while in 1800 it was less than 5%. Meanwhile, Cities, many of which we know nothing about in the West, cities such as Chongqing, Manila, Jakarta, will grow beyond all imagining, and nobody seriously believes that these giant conurbations will be places of ease and urbanity. In the face of this reality, how have cities retained their magnetic attraction? The answer is that mankind has always succeeded in simultaneously holding in mind two contradictory images of the city whereby the unsatisfactory reality is sustained by a platonic ideal of what a city should be, perhaps even might one day become. Every inhabitant of a city has his or her dream of urbanity, for without it, life would be barely tolerable. Such dreams are, of course, endlessly diverse. For an intellectual, it might be an ideal of free and informed discourse. For the recent immigrant, it could be little more than freedom from fear and freedom from want. Always, whether or not formulated in such terms, above all the diverse individual aspirations of its teeming inhabitants lies the great overarching metaphor of the city as ultimate incarnation of human society, from the Civitas Dei of the medieval scholar to Le Corbusier's Cité Radieuse. And so, when St. John the Divine looked for a metaphor with which to bring the Book of Revelations to its final triumphant close, he had no need to seek far. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, 
coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And the city lieth foursquare, and the city is as large as the breadth. And the angel measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof, an hundred and four cubits, according to the measure of man, that is, of the angel. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming out on a hideous evening. <laughs>